Yeah, as as was said before, Operation Royalty Rescue is so grateful for you to be here and sharing your platform. Um, so I just wanted to go ahead and, and give the floor to you because we've already gone through and <laughs> wasted some time. So go ahead and um, just let us know who you are and um, your story. Absolutely. So my name is Jose Alfaro and I grew up um, down south in Texas. Um, I grew up in a very conservative town. If there's anyone from Navasota, Texas that's on tonight, thank you for joining and thank you for listening. Um, but the reason why I share my story today is because I do feel a need to speak up for voices that aren't being heard. And some of those voices that I feel that are constantly unheard, that go unheard, are people within the LGBTQ community. Um, growing up in a conservative town, I constantly felt like I wasn't really, I wasn't really treated equally to a lot of my peers, a lot of my friends, a lot of other people. Um, and so coming to terms with my sexuality, it was really, really hard for me um, growing up in a conservative town, but also being religious as well. Um, so it was really tough trying to figure out who I was, um, but then also taking into consideration what everyone was gonna think of me. And so that's kind of where my whole story begins is me trying to figure out my identity, coming to terms with it, but also hoping that people are going to be accepting of it. Um, so I ended up um, being moved away um, because I ended up getting my father found out that I was talking to another guy. Um, and so it became an issue. And my parents basically asked me how they were going to fix me. And so that right there tells you, shows you the lack of support that I had in my life. Um, so a lot of times when our youth is in a position where they don't have support, or maybe they're kicked out of their home, or they are runaways um, because they fear um, maybe whatever's going on at home or what people are going to think of them. So they try to find a way out. Um, but what they don't realize is that when they leave and they don't have that support, that sometimes they're placed in a situation where they are vulnerable to people like pedophiles or traffickers, um, mm -hmm. which was very much the case with me. So I ended up um, moving to San Antonio, Texas, um, I moved in with a cousin of mine, and I began school there, and when I came back home, my father confronted me and said, have you changed? Are you, are you straight now? Um, and that for me was kind of just like a moment where I had already started to come terms with who I was, and I figured out that there was no way that I could change, um, no matter what I did or how much I tried. Um, so I ended up getting into an argument with my father. My father kicked me out and I went to a friend's place and I went online to a, a gay chat site. And on this gay chat site, that is when a guy named Jason Gandy contacted me and asked me how my day was going. And I was having a terrible day, obviously. Um, and I also had no idea where I was going to end up or where I was going to go. And so I told this guy what was going on. I told him what was happening in my life. And he then began to show me a ton of empathy. He told me that he felt really bad for me, that he's had friends who have gone through similar situations, um, and that he wanted to help me in any way that he could. And so he then began to paint this amazing picture. This picture that made me think that if I made the decision to go with him, then my life was going to be a hundred times better. He told me he owned a nine-bedroom home in Austin, Texas. He told me that his father, grandfather, left him a pressure washer business. I don't know if it's washer pressure, pressure washer. Um, and he sold it for about, he told me about a million dollars. So in my head, I'm thinking, this guy's wealthy, he's going to take care of me, he has the means, and this is, I'm so lucky for this opportunity. And so he then says, 
I can come and pick you up from Houston. I'm here for business. If that's something that you're interested in. And I paused for a moment. I thought about it. And I said, do you mind calling me so that we can talk over the phone? Um, Mm -hmm. I felt like I wanted to get a little more comfortable with him before I made that decision. And I know that an hour doesn't make that much of a difference. But for me, it, it was what felt like my only option. So I spoke with him on the phone for about an hour and he, I made the decision to go with him. So he came to pick me up in the small town, Navasota, Texas, and he took me to Houston. And within the first two days, our, the, what people call the grooming process kind of started to begin. It started with the types of foods that I was eating. He made sure that I was eating super healthy, um, super clean. It was basically Raisin Bran cereal in the morning. Um, In the afternoon, we would go to the grocery store and steal protein bars. Um, I still don't understand why that was what we did, but we did. Um, Then we would go to the gym. I'd come back to his place. We would have some form of vegetables and meat, protein. And then we'd go back to the gym for the second time. And then that was basically our routine daily. Um, From there, I then, um, he then presented me with an idea. He said to me, look, eventually you're going to want to live a life of your own where you can support yourself. And he said, the only way that I can, that you can do this is if you join me in my massage business. And when he presented that idea to me, I was 100% on board. I'm like, I can do this. This is easy. Like, I just have to give a massage and I make money. That's, that's simple. Um, and so I then said, well, I don't really know how to give a massage. And he said, don't worry about it. When you're in there, just do what I do and you'll get it and it'll be easy. And I said, okay. So then he shows me his RMT website, his, his massage website. Um, he explained to me how he got clients and he explained to me that these clients were interested in men with a good physique. Um, and so he told me to take a photo of myself shirtless, um, so that I can basically get clients because of how I look and because of my body. Um, Then he told me if anyone were to ever ask, which he did not believe they would, but if anyone were to ask my age, I had to tell them that I was 18 years old. Mind you, at the time I was 16 um, and I had no issue lying about my age. But again, the only reason why he told me to lie was because I couldn't have a license as a therapist. if I was under the age of 18. So that's what I was thinking in my head. But in reality, he was fearing that he could get in trouble and this could send him to prison, basically. So we go into the first massage and the first massage immediately became sexual. It was, the guy was, it was a married man. He was very successful from what it seemed based on his wedding ring and his, the type of clothing that he had laying next to the bed. Um, And then the door was shut behind us. And I looked at Jason and Jason then began to remove his clothing. And while I'm watching him, I'm thinking, oh no, I know what this is going to be. I know what's gonna happen here. And I started to kind of panic. Um, And so I looked at him to kind of guide me and let me know what I'm supposed to do. And he just shook his head, yes, which meant take your clothes off. So I removed my clothing um, and we began the massage. Um, The massage at first was basically us just completely naked in a room giving a massage. And then I realized that 
Jason then allowed the clients to touch me and to perform oral sex on me. Um, as soon as it kind of started to get a little more aggressive, he then told me, you're free to leave. You can get out of the room. I'll finish. And so I basically booked it out of there. I got out of the room, went into the other room, and I'm not going to lie, I started to think, okay, this isn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. And so I continued. I continued doing what he told me I had to do. Um, and I continued performing the massages. Now, as the week continued, the month continued, um, the massages then began to progress and get worse and worse. Um, and it got to a point to where Jason ended up leaving the room at times um, and left me alone with the clients. And that was almost like a signal for the clients to be able to do whatever they wanted with me. And I think that was when I started to realize that I felt extremely un unsafe and that I needed to leave. Um, so with everything that was going on, I, I think that one of the questions that I get most often is why didn't you just leave? And the reason for that is one, I had nowhere to go. I didn't know where I was going to end up. I didn't know what was going to happen to me. Two, within performing these massages, there's a reaction that you get to where you start to think like, maybe I should just leave right now. Um, but when that door shuts and he locks the door, you then start to think in your head, there's a reason why he shut the door. There's a reason why he locked it. And if I make the decision to change my mind right here in this room with these two grown men, is the man on the table going to get up and harm me in some form of way because he doesn't want me to tell the world that this is what he did to me? Is Jason going to stop me and harm me because he doesn't want me to go and tell law enforcement as well? Is something going to happen to me um, that is going to lead me locked in a room or in trouble of some sort? Not only that, I also didn't know that what was happening to me was trafficking. Um, I also, years after this whole situation, for a long time, I thought, I can't really tell anybody because if I tell someone, what if I get in trouble? What if I go to jail for the things that I did? And so I began to form this shame and this hate um, for myself. Um, but I want to take a few steps back because I realized that I kind of missed an important part. The things that he promised me were never the truth. It was never reality. When we went to his quote unquote nine bedroom home in Austin, Texas, it was a five bedroom home that was divided by bedroom sheets. Um, that created a nine-bedroom home. And within these small rooms with a bed and sheep dividing them, there were college students living there. These college students, I do not believe, participated in any of the massages. I don't believe that they were trafficked, but it was a way for him to make money. And so he was driven by money and money only. He didn't care about what he was doing to me. He didn't care what he had done to other people. Um, and so I then began to realize he had a bigger infatuation with really, really young boys. And I know this because I watched him as he would stare at like seven, eight-year-old boys in a grocery store or while we're at the mall or wherever we are. And I questioned him at one point and I said, what are you doing? And he said, what? And I said, why are you looking at that little boy like that? And he said, I can't look. And I said, well, not the way that you're looking at him. And he got extremely upset with me. Um, and I think that was a sign for me that was like, this is beyond just you. There's 
something else going on that's much bigger and you need to start thinking about a way to get out of here. And then there was a final massage that happened. And within this final massage, I noticed that Jason was acting differently this day. Um, and right before the massage, just the way he was going about setting up the room, his body language, his movements, the way he was treating me that day, I noticed something was up. And sure enough, when we go into the massage room, he says to me, the client wants to massage you. So I'm gonna ask you to get on the massage table and let him give you a massage. And in this moment, I'm just like, I really don't wanna do this. I know what's gonna happen to me and I don't want this to happen. But again, I'm in a position to where if I say something, I don't know what's gonna happen to me. And so he shuts the door, I get undressed, I get under the sheet on the table and long story short, the guy ended up raping me. Um, and I just remember feeling completely numb. I felt like I was blacking out. I felt like it was something that I didn't want to remember. It wasn't something that I wanted to want it to happen at all. Um, but if there's one thing that I remember the most, it was the fact that the guy, after everything, after raping me, gets up with his clothes off and comes over and kisses me on the forehead. And that for me was just like the end. I was like, I have to get out of here. I have to leave. And so I contacted a guy that I had been talking to years or about a year before this. And I asked him to come and pick me up from San Antonio. And in this moment, I told Jason that I was going for a bike ride. And I set it all up the next morning. He was going to come and pick me up. And that's how I left. And that's how I got out. I was with him for about three months total. Um, and it was a really, really unstable time in my life to where I didn't have support. I didn't know what I was going to do with the rest of my life, where previous to this, I was getting ready to go to a university. I was getting ready to go to college and have an amazing life. But because of not being accepted because of who I was. I was then placed in a situation to where I couldn't support myself, I couldn't survive, and I had to figure out how to do it on my own. Therefore, I couldn't finish college. I couldn't finish school. I couldn't do the things that I needed to do to end up successful. And that is probably the number one thing that has affected me in so many ways for my future. Um, from there, I ended up in what people call survival sex. Um, survival sex is basically prostitution, but you do what you can to survive, to provide for yourself, to eat, to have a home, to go to bed at night. But I also then began using alcohol and drugs, and I started to get extremely depressed. I had really bad anxiety, and I also suffered from extreme PTSD. And I didn't even know these things about me, um, but it wasn't until, I want to say recently, that I realized that what was happening to me was because of all the trauma that I have experienced in my past life. Um, but um, flash forward to... 2012, I moved to Boston, Massachusetts, and I enroll into cosmetology school, and I meet my current boyfriend, who I've been with for eight years now, and we have a, an awesome relationship. He is so respectful to me. He treats me the right way. He loves me, um, and I was going through these really hard moments of, again, this PTSD that was affecting me. 
And I thought that the only way that I could cope was through the alcohol. And I got myself into a lot of trouble. I did things that I regret. Um, I did things that um, made me look a certain way. Um, but as I started to kind of pick up the pieces and I kind of got my life together, um, I started to realize how important it was to take care of myself. Um, and so in 2014, a friend comes to visit me from Houston, Texas, and he says, Jose, I know what happened to you when you were a teenager. He's like, don't ask me how I know. He's like, I just came to tell you and you need to look it up online. So he sends me this, he shows me this website and Jason was arrested um, going to London with a 15 year old boy where he was going to basically traffic him at the London Olymp Olympics in 2012. Um, and it was Homeland Security that stopped him as they landed in, in London. And they thought that it was extremely suspicious that he was with a young boy who was not related to him. And so they stopped him. They found 50 condoms within his suitcase. Um, and then they questioned and asked if he had intent of sleeping with the underage boy and also if he had intent of trafficking him. And I believe he admitted to having sex with him. Um, I don't believe he admitted to trafficking. Um, so 2014, I found out about this story and I contact the hotline, um, which I highly recommend that if anyone ever has questions, if anyone is ever in a situation similar to what I've gone through, contact this hotline and they have so many different um, resources that can help you in whatever part or place that you're in within this whole situation. Um, but I contact the hotline and I then, they get me in contact with the U.S. Attorney's Office that is working on the case. And I didn't know what was going to happen. Um, I didn't know anything about law. I didn't know anything about civil litigation. Um, and then an attorney contacted me. So I, I'm then working with the U.S. Attorney's Office, but then I then have this civil suit that someone told me that I should pursue. And mind you, I had no idea what a civil suit was. I didn't know what the U.S. Attorney's Office was. I didn't know any of these words or what it meant. And so I was completely lost. And all I said to them was, I will be 100% transparent. I will tell you everything that happened. All I want to do is help in any shape or form that I can. And they said, great, that's all that we need you to do. And so six years went by, six whole years. And we finally went to trial in 2018. In 2018, Jason Gandy was sentenced to 30 years in prison with no chance of parole. Um, 2019, I pursued my civil suit against him, and this was in Texas. And so for a LGBTQ Latino male who has gone through such horrible things and has gone my entire life feeling like no one is ever going to help me. No one is ever going to understand. No one is ever going to care. This judge, we um, sued Jason for $400,000. Um, the lawyers come up with these numbers um, based on all these different figures that they come up with. And so we sue him for $400,000. And the judge then grants me $1.43 million. Now, I will say this, that is not anything that I will probably ever see. I don't know. Um, but the whole point is, is that this was a situation that truly helped me feel like I'm a human being and there are people out there that actually care about me. And there are people out there that are actually going to help me. And it was life-changing for me. It then helped me realize my worth, um, and it helped me realize that there are probably other people out there who are just like me, who are in a similar situation, and I want to be able to do anything and everything that I can do to help those people that are in the same situation. And it all is going to start with me being 100% transparent 
and sharing my story on every single outlet that I can. And that's what I've been doing for the past two years now. And I will say I'm also super excited because I am finishing up my memoir. Um, it has the craziest stories in there. Um, and it goes into detail about every single situation that I've touched base on tonight, um, but also a ton of other stories. Some of them are funny. Some of them are crazy. Some of them are sad, insane, devastating. Um, but I will tell you this, um, sharing my story and being able to understand what it all means, um, it has helped me heal 100%. Every time I share my story, I get a little bit stronger. And that, for me, means the world to me. So that is, <laughs> that is my whole story. And yes. Oh, my goodness. I mean, I can speak, I'm sure, on behalf of ORR. Your story is incredible. It's so empowering. Um, you, you just give so much amazing information. And I know people are going to be so grateful for all the things that you shared. Um, as heartbreaking as it is, you're just so brave. And I'm so, like, survivor to survivor, I'm so proud of you. Thank um, you. Thank you. So I'm just going to check out and see um, if we have some questions for you. Um, we have thank you for sharing um, and being vulnerable. Thank you for sharing your story. I'm so sorry. Um, we have a question. Did it take courage to contact your way out or was it like enough is enough? Um, that's a good question. To be honest with you, leaving... I did start to form some type of friendship with Jason. Mind you, I'm living with him, so I'm spending a lot of time with him. So it's not like it was a situation to where he was mean to me or evil all the time. If anything, it became somewhat of a friendship. And I hate to say that because it might make people think like, oh, it must not have been that bad. But that's usually what traffickers do. They want to get close to you. They want to get in and they want to feel like they're going to trust me and I'm going to be able to do whatever I want with them. And that's what Jason did. Jason knew how to pick a specific person that is extremely vulnerable and he knew exactly what to say to make them feel like this is going to be the best thing ever. And so because I started to form that friendship, I began to analyze him. I began to understand how he sleeps, when he wakes up, is he a heavy sleeper? You know, and so with these things, I then figured out, okay, it's gonna be super easy for me to just contact someone, lie to him and make my way out the door. And so for me, it was almost like as if, I started to think in my head, well, he's playing a game with me. I can play the same game. And with that game, I can make him believe that he can trust me, that I'm never going to leave. And that's what he did. And I just left. It, and to be honest with you, to answer that question, yes, enough was enough at that point. Yeah, I think that it's so important when you touch on vulnerability because, you know, when we talk about survivors of sex trafficking, we do look at children and we look at those who are vulnerable because, you know, they haven't been accepted for being um, gay, bisexual, a part of that LGBTQ community, um, or they're, you know, they have parents that have been in drugs and alcohol and all those things. So it's the vulnerable and that's exactly what grooming is, right? It's uh, making you feel kind of normal in your situation. That's completely not normal. And um, yeah, so I think you touched on that so perfectly. Oh, yes, vulnerability. I mean, and like you said, um, children with parents who have a drug addiction, I was actually speaking on that earlier. So I'm a hairdresser full time. And um, I speak with people every single day. And every chance that I get to share 
either my experience or knowledge on trafficking. I know trafficking is such a hot topic right now. Everybody wants to be involved, which is great. Everyone wants to talk about it, which is fantastic. Um, but we want to make sure that, that the right knowledge is being shared, the right information, so that people can truly help. Um, but I was speaking with someone earlier, and they were just like, I never understood what types of vulner how many different types of vulnerability is out there and i'm like it goes on on and on and on and on i mean you could just live in a poor neighborhood or come from a poor family and that is vulnerability you need money you need to provide for either yourself or your siblings or your family in some form of way and so it puts you in a position to where you go searching for that help and a lot of times you are now in a vulnerable position and people like Jason sense that vulnerability and they, it's like a magnet. They're instantly attracted to you. And that's what's scary is that it could be anybody. It could be a teacher. It could be a police officer. It could be a lawyer. It, it could be anybody. And that is the scary thing. That is the scary thing. Um, but yeah. Absolutely. I totally, I agree with you completely. Um, so I'm just going to look at some more questions. Um, if anybody has questions, please feel free to put them in the, in the comments. And if Jose feels comfortable, he'll, he'll answer them for you. Um, so after coming out of trafficking, did you have to take any kind of therapy? Sorry, I think Am it I went lagging? out for a second. Yeah, it said, did I, you said, did I have to take any? Uh, therapy. Did you need any therapy after? I needed, <laughs> I needed a lot of things. Um, but it wasn't until after the trial when I, I didn't know what it was that I needed, to be honest with you. No one had told me, after everything that you've gone through, you should probably be in therapy. But even if someone did tell me that, I probably wouldn't have done it, to be honest with you. Um, but there was a point in the trial, and someone asked me this, was it hard looking at Jason? Was it hard facing him? Was it hard, yada, yada, yada? It could have been so hard for you. And I was like, no, it wasn't hard. And I remember a specific moment where they asked me to identify him and they asked me to identify him by a piece of clothing. And I said, he's wearing a blue and white striped shirt. And I looked at him and I looked at him for three solid minutes and I stared at him and I tried to see if there was in any tiny bit of remorse in his eyes. And I didn't feel that at all. And in that moment, I was just like, this is easy. This is no big deal. But then there was a moment where they asked me to identify a boy in a picture. And they put this photo of me that I've seen a million times, that I have shared on Facebook, that I've shared on MySpace at the time, well, when MySpace was a thing. Um, and I had this photo with me. I, like I said, I've seen it a million times. And they put it up. And there's an entire room that's looking at this photo. And it was for the first time that I actually saw myself like actually saw myself at that time. And it was literally like slow motion where like all of these thoughts came into my head and I was just like, who are you? How did you go from that to here? And now all of these people in this room are talking about these horrible things that happened to this poor boy. And I, I couldn't even figure out how I ended up where I am. And I remember I went to the hotel room that night and I drank the entire night. I drank until I was blackout. I woke up the next morning. I had anxiety up the roof. My PTSD was acting up. I was going crazy and I almost committed suicide. When I contacted my boyfriend, I told him that I was gonna do something stupid and he kept saying, please just calm down. He calmed me down. He helped me through it and that was a moment where I was just like I need help 
and I need therapy. And that is when I got into therapy. Um, it was, it took me a while to find a therapist that really could help me with the type of things that I was experiencing, um, the amount of trauma that I was experiencing. Um, so I will say there were a lot of moments where I was just like, I don't want to do this anymore. Like I'm never going to find the right person. But for anyone that has been struggling with the type of trauma or any type of anything, depression, trauma, anxiety, um, never give up on finding that right therapist for you because there is someone out there. And when you find that right person to help you, it will change you for forever. Um, but I also think that I also gave myself my own form of therapy. And that therapy was being good to my body, um, eating the right food, exercising, and doing things the way I wanted to do them. Being able to go to the gym when I wanted to go to the gym. Being able to eat healthy when I want to eat healthy. And then to see my progress and to feel good and to have this clear mind, I then became excited and it just got better and better and better. I got a trainer, um, I got a therapist, I try to eat healthy as often as possible, um, but I do these things now because I wanna do them. Not because Jason wants me to do them, not because my father wants me to be more masculine or act a certain way or be a certain way. I do them because Jose wants to do them. And so I highly suggest that if anyone's going through anything, maybe start by changing a couple of habits and then see where that goes. But um, yes, I needed therapy. <laughs> Yes. Oh my gosh. You are just incredible. You're so incredible. I'm so like, I'm empowered. So I know that, you know, as a survivor, other survivors are empowered and really you're helping parents too. I mean, when we think about survivors, um, sometimes survivors are so young that the parents are the ones watching these videos and they're learning and educating themselves. And so, you know, you could be helping a parent, like, okay, let me see if my child wants to get into like this activity or that activity to become themselves and get out of that grooming process that they've been in. Absolutely. So we've got a few more questions. Um, how do you advocate for the LGBTQ community specifically? Specifically, so right now, so I will tell you, it is really hard um, to, to get your voice out there and to get your story out there. And so I started by just telling anyone and everyone I could about my story. And then it turned into um, people reaching out to me once they heard my story. Um, and so then it has now led to me working with Polaris, me working with these different organizations that, or Operation Royalty Rescue, I mean, it's because of these organizations that are able to raise my voice um, to get out to any young gay man, bisexual, transgender um, out there to help them. And right mm -hmm. now, I'm only out of place to where I can. That's the only way that I've been able to advocate. Um, but I think that it's one of the biggest and best ways to advocate for any type of community. Um, it's just by sharing your story and being 100% open and honest. Yeah, absolutely. I think that it's such a great time right now for survivors to, to be able to have their voices lifted because so many people are um, invested in educating themselves on this. Um, so the next question we have is, how do you feel this experience of abuse affects your relationship? Oh, <laughs> it, um, it has affected it more negatively than anything, I will say that. Um, thank God that I'm with someone that has somewhat some patience to deal with me <laughs> and to handle me, um, because mm -hmm. I have moments to where I, I'm outside of myself. I don't even know how I'm acting. I don't even know how I'm reacting. 
And there have been a lot of scary moments to where I've had to learn that my behavior is unacceptable. It doesn't matter what I've gone through. It doesn't matter. And none of that matters. But when there's someone that you love and that you care about and you are behaving the way that you are and it's affecting them, um, it kind of just hit me in the face and I'm like, I've got to take a step back. And again, it's all of that work that you have to do with yourself, but it has affected it in the bedroom. It has affected it just every single little argument that we have. All of it has come from this of this trauma that I've experienced. Um, one thing that I will say that has a way that it's impacted my relationship is trust. It is really, really hard for me to trust someone any second that I have that makes me feel similar to the trauma that I've experienced with Jason in my past. And the second that I get that feeling I just become a different person and that is not okay because now I'm in a completely different relationship and now I'm almost blaming him for things that Jason did to me. And there were a lot of moments where I go back mentally to 16 year old Jose and I have to realize that and snap back and just be like, no, this is not okay. Take a step back, take a deep breath, figure this out. Um, and so, yes, it's impacted my relationship on so many different levels. But again, thank God. And that has been so supportive of me. Um, and I think that that is probably why we've lasted so long together. Eight years, it's a long time. <laughs> that is a long time. And congratulations to you too, because it really is a partnership when you work through abuse, when you work through abuse with someone. Absolutely. Oh, <laughs> okay. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Um, we have one more question. Is there any advice or tips you have for parents? Love and accept your children. Let them become who they are meant to become. Let them change their mind. Let them grow. Let them be children. <laughs> That's probably the best advice. Um, maybe even stop pushing them to be something that they're not. I mean, for a long time, my parents wanted me to be this big, masculine, macho, powerful man and I'm like I'm sorry I'm five foot two and I'm not growing anymore and this is just who I am and it's not all about sexuality a lot of it has to do with just letting them be period if they want to do dance if they want to do gymnastics if they want to do cheerleading if they whatever it is that they want to do let them do it because who knows they might be the next Olympian they might be the next American Idol, I don't know. Um, but just let your children be, be children. I think that's the best advice that I can give parents, for sure. Yeah, I think, I think that's an amazing tip, especially coming from someone who your situation ultimately happens because you didn't have that acceptance. Um, and, and that's a sad truth for so many kids um, that end up in your situation. Absolutely. Well... I think that's all we have for questions. So is there anything else that you would like to share with everyone or say? Um, I think that if I could share one thing, mm -hmm. it would probably be <laughs> when it comes to trafficking, just realize one, that it can happen to anyone and everyone. It could be your neighbor who traffics someone. It could be your best friend. It could be your doctor. It could be anyone. And open your eyes. Make sure that your child is not in a vulnerable place. And make sure that you take care of your children and be there for them. Um, but also make sure that you're getting your information from the right sources as well. I think there's a lot of misinformation out there right now. Um, 
I'm not going to go into detail because a lot of it is political and I don't like to be all that political sometimes. Um, <laughs> but just make yeah. sure you're getting the right information from the right organization. Um, right. You know, there's a lot of organizations out there that have been doing this for a very long time and they're getting statistics. They're getting the right information. Make sure you're getting the right information on this topic. And then then you can share it. Then you can spread that awareness. I think that's going to be the best help that you can do for any survivor, anyone who's going through it, or possible future um, victims or survivors of human trafficking. Absolutely. Oh my goodness, you're so right. Um, well, we're so grateful that you sat down with us tonight and shared your testimony, your story with the world. Um, that vulnerability is just incredible and you did such a great job and we're just honored that we had you. Um, so thank you so much, Jose. Thank you for happen having me and thank you for raising my voice. I truly appreciate it. Of course, survivors' voices are so important. We're so grateful that you came. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a great night, Jose. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.